Now for our final panel for today, Islands Are Rising for Human Society, will be a conversation between Lieutenant Governor of Guam, Joshua Tenorio, Lieutenant Governor of Hawaii, Josh Green, and Lieutenant Governor of the U.S. Virgin Islands, Trigenza Roach, about how to improve the quality of life in the islands. Later, they will be joined by panelists who will share how their work contributes to a sustainable future for islands. And we will have a special message from the Honorable Maria Leonor Girona Robredo, the Vice President of the Philippines. And now I'd like to introduce Lieutenant Governor Joshua Tenorio. Tomorrow. I ask you to rise up, rise up and share your talents, rise up and put your ideas into action, rise up to serve your community, rise up to stand for equality for all and against discrimination, rise up to protect our environment, rise up to move our island forward. Half a day, I'd like to extend a warm welcome from Guam to all our participants joining us from around the world. It's truly a pleasure to gather virtually with you today in common purpose to achieve a sustainable future for all our islands and our planet. planet. We continue learning from the University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability and this conference that sustainability is about meeting the needs of today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. This includes environmental, economic, and human society considerations. We clearly see that in the United Nations sustainable development goals, such as no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, reduced inequalities and gender equality. I'm happy to moderate this panel to highlight the human society aspects of, of sustainability. You will see that our islands are truly rising for human society. Joining me first on this first part of this panel are my good friends and colleagues, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green of Hawaii, and Lieutenant Governor Tregenza Roach of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Lieutenant Governor Green is a local physician, husband and father of two, who has dedicated his life to caring for Hawaii families. He was born in New York, grew up in Pennsylvania, and later became a physician in the rural districts of Hawaii. He witnessed firsthand the lack of healthcare resources in those areas. It was his inspiration to begin, to begin his local political career and bring a voice to under, underserved communities. He was elected to the Hawaii State House in 2004, the State Senate in 2008, and later elected Hawaii's Lieutenant Governor in 2018. Josh's priorities include the COVID-19 response, the homelessness crisis, lack of affordable housing, healthcare disparities, and statewide shortage of medical professionals. Tregenza Roach is a lawyer, born in St. Kitts and migrated to the U.S. Virgin Islands at age eight. He started his career as a journalist and later completed law school where he honed his skills as an effective problem solver, innovative thinker, and detailed analyst. He's worked as legal counsel for the Virgin Islands Commissioner on Education. He's been the executive director for the Board of Education and faculty at the University of the Virgin Islands. Elected to the USVI legislature, he served as a staunch advocate for education, the environment, youth, and elderly. He was elected as Lieutenant Governor in 2018. Tregenza is a humanitarian, a thought leader, having served as a board member of the Disability Rights Center and Mental Health Advocacy Group, Clear Blue Sky. He's been chairman of the UV Humanities Council, and he is an award-winning poet and author. Half a day. Hello, brother. How you doing, Josh? Great to see you. Yes, Trigenza, good to see you too. Now, uh, just for the Guam community, uh, Trigenza actually has been to Guam. So this is his second uh, visit, I guess. Uh, and Josh Green has a trip to Guam still lined up, hopefully before the next election cycle. Now, Josh, uh, I had a chance before the pandemic to visit with you in Hawaii, and one of the reasons is the two of us have been focused in on homelessness issues. And uh, I remember vividly going to one of the parks and meeting um, one of the leaders of a homelessness, a homeless encampment who happened to be Chamorro, a native of Guam. Um, in your discussions um, at the National Lieutenant Governor's Conference and throughout the country, you've talked about uh, reducing um, healthcare disparities by addressing housing. C 
Could you tell us more about uh, that philosophy and how that's been effective in dealing with um, a big crisis in Hawaii? Yes, and thank you for welcoming me, Josh, and, and everyone. It's really, it's great to meet you, Trigenza, and it's, uh, these are challenges that, uh, like the pandemic, which has been an acute challenge and, and rolled through our world uh, and has been you know, violent in many ways, so, so can the same thing be said of homelessness and the way it rolls through our society in a way that a lot of people may not take notice directly, but indirectly it affects our moral fabric and it also affects really what we can do as a society because it impacts so many different parts of our culture. Uh, in Hawaii, we have the highest per capita rate of homelessness in the nation. And a lot of that is because, well, some people will, will kind of migrate to Hawaii uh, because of the climate. And then there's of course poverty, which has set people into a cycle whether it's uh, because it's so expensive to live in the islands or because uh, with the surge in methamphetamine and other large challenges and the, and the lack of behavioral health care and mental health services, people really um, ended up in a devastated state. And so a very small percentage of our people uh, may, may experience homelessness at any one time. In Hawaii, it's about 1% of our population. It consumes a very large amount of our resource. So uh, we see people struggling, we see people suffering, and individuals who are homeless, especially if they're chronically homeless, may consume as much as 60% of our resources for those in need of our Medicaid budget. Specifically, 3.6% of our, of our population, which had severe and chronic illness, many of whom are homeless, consume 61% of our resources. And you can imagine what that does. It makes any other uh, solution which we would like to be sustainable uh, apropos of today's discussion and our conference leaders, very difficult because you can't sustain any solutions if you are in a um, essentially a death spiral as far as resources and helping people out. And we found ourselves in that space. However, we noticed that we can disrupt that, that cycle, if you will, by uh, providing um, humanitarian care uh, in the form of housing. I actually view, as a physician, I view housing as healthcare. And I, I know I've shared that with you, Josh, on a few occasions. The moment you give an individual a house, in Hawaii at least, you decrease, uh, the, number one, the average lifespan for a homeless individual is 30 years less than an individual who's not without a home. So average lifespan is 51 years in Hawaii if you are homeless. The average spend per person is $82,000 per person per year if they're in that cycle of mental illness and homelessness and drug addiction. It's far, it's like eight times higher than our spend for other people who are similarly sick. And they suffer so terribly. The moment you apply service that's sustainable, specifically a roof over their head, we drop their costs 43 to 73%, depending on the population and who we were helping. We drop their drug and alcohol consumption by 60%, and people's lives began to turn around. And so there are so many things when we speak about sustainability and kind of the, I think it's the, um, you know, the heart of like our Aloha challenge and, and applying good analytics to help people in their lives. It has to come from the heart, but when you do those things, you can actually make a change broadly for the better. And we would like to do so much more. We've just begun to scratch the surface. We started our institute called H4, which I can maybe talk more about later. We started what we're calling Kahale, which are um, small, tiny villages where people can go and get housing uh, for either free or very, very little tiny houses. And we noticed that we're already seeing improvements in culture because everyone rallies, the wealthy rally, developers rally, communities rally, because instead of seeing people that are devastated with homelessness, they see people that are having some hope. So that's one of our approaches. And, and I, I hope that it fits into this discussion about what are disruptors and what can be done for society. Now, some of the work has been complicated by um, the pandemic that we've all been dealing with. And of course, being islands uh, with limited uh, healthcare facility and limited healthcare personnel, uh, it becomes extremely um, challenging. And of course, the Hawaii and the Virgin Islands and Guam uh, are big um, on tourism. We rely on tourism for big uh, portions of our infrastructure and our big portions of our funding. Uh, so the situation with COVID, I know you've been taking a leadership position in uh, trying to address it. I know that 
Uh, you're on daily um, on social media giving um, the citizens and residents of your state updates about the situation. Um, what are some of the, I, I see a lot of progress in Hawaii. Um, are, how are you addressing um, disparities of any in trying to uh, either get COVID uh, testing or treatment into uh, communities that um, have access to healthcare issues uh, and vaccinations for that matter? Well, I, I really appreciate the question. So uh, yeah, to, to preface where we went. So when we locked down on, I think it was March 25th, we dropped our, our travelers or our visitor industry by 99.6%. So it was a shocking drop. I mean, if you've ever gone really off of a cliff, that was one example. And uh, we, so we went from 30,000 visitors a day down to like 400. And it was necessary to stop COVID. We were anticipating uh, over 4,400 deaths and we had 467 to date. So thank goodness that decision was made. However, it completely devastated the economy and it aggravated other health disparities and disparities for education. There's so many, you know, for those who can't afford an education separate from our public schools, which I'm a big fan of, it was devastating. No education for children for the better part of a year or very limited. For the, for the needs that we have from a healthcare standpoint, most healthcare facilities were closed or limited except for urgent or emergent care. And that made it even worse for those who had no access to a physician or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. What we did though, is we decided that we were not going to allow the traditional um, approach to services guide the COVID response. So for one thing, as you can well imagine, absolutely no cost for anyone who wants to get a vaccine or chooses to get a vaccine. That would be completely unacceptable. Then the next things that we decided was as we wrote the plan, I was fortunate to help write the vaccination plan, which has worked very well in Hawaii. We're amongst the best states for getting vaccine to people. We decided that we would um, be very deliberate about getting vaccines to individuals in different uh, parts of our culture that had large health disparities. Like for example, in Kalihi where the non-Hawaiian Pacific Islander community was living and was seeing a very large rate of COVID. 4% of our population were non-Hawaii Pacific Islanders, and they made up 31% of all the COVID cases, mostly because people were living in multi-generational housing, they were sharing space with their kupuna and so on. It was just devastating. And then lots and lots of people ended up in the hospital who also already had chronic health conditions. And so therefore their mortality rate would be very high. So what we did is we wrote into the plan that we would authorize the director of health to go into any community of, of um, heightened risk did not have to be race-based. It was heightened risk based on the public health question and the analytics of the public health question and do vaccination. So we've been holding vaccine clinics, for example, uh, for the Samoan community and um, those who are from, um, from Micronesia and, and, and anyone from, from communities of need that would otherwise normally be last in line as we know how that always plays out. We made sure that we went out and embraced those communities. And so the, so the COVID rates have dropped really precipitously for anyone that we've chosen to work closely with. That worked for our elders. It worked for um, this community that I just described. And so all of these things were, uh, maybe we got a little lucky with some decisions. We got a lot of good advice actually from um, experts and elders in the community. And so we're very proud of that. Uh, we make plenty of mistakes in Hawaii, no doubt. Uh, but in this particular case, we were able to really minimize um, the, the devastating impact of, of COVID on, on families. I think, you know, all of us should have our share of challenges. Uh, and of course, uh, mistakes are made, uh, but uh, I think the issue is making sure that you correct them very fast and try and change course. Now in the Virgin Islands, of course, uh, you know, many people don't realize the Virgin Islands really is our twin. We both have the same, uh, we went through the same uh, evolution of self-government together. We are organic tax are almost twins. We uh, have a very, very similar uh, government structure. Uh, and uh, our good friend, Lieutenant Governor Roach, who's been a longtime advocate uh, for education, he's been a change agent in improving education. Um, and Lieutenant Governor Green, you talked about um, the devastating loss of learning and we see it here. Uh, where we have uh, nearly 40,000 kids that 
you know, were out of school, um, you know, some in relative periods of isolation. And so I wanted to ask um, Lieutenant Governor Roach, uh, I know I've been monitoring the situation in the Virgin Islands. Of course, all of us have the challenges you have. Uh, you get uh, more tourism from the continental United States, especially, uh, you know, unfortunately, the U.S. has been one of the largest um, uh, populations that have had the COVID experience. How are you addressing the situation um, of education? What do, you, what do you think is going to, what is it going to take to try and recover some of this learning loss? Well, uh, so uh, first of all, I just wanted to, uh, to greet you, uh, Lieutenant Governor, half a day, I think I'm saying it correctly. And That's right. To Lieutenant Governor Green as well. And to all the panelists here today and to the people of Guam, uh, thank you so much for your great hospitality when I visited. And uh, I bring you greetings from my people as well as from our governor, Albert Bryan Jr. I also wanted to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me. And I think this is a really good conversation at this time. And while it seems that we are all uh, challenged by the, uh, the pandemic, still there is so much great opportunity. Um, and I say that mindful of the almost 3 million people who've lost their lives and uh, may God's grace you know, comfort the families of those people. But it has given us a gift and that gift I believe is time. Uh, I don't believe that I've spent more time by myself and with my family uh, in any recent time than, than in this pandemic. And so in that time, there has been this opportunity to, to, to reflect, to reflect, uh, to assess, to plan, uh, to grow and to grow better and stronger. And with a nation that was pretty much floundering in this pandemic, we realized very early on that we would have to save ourselves, that there was nobody who was going to be coming uh, to do that for us. And one of the things that we realized we had to do was to work together. So we pulled together a task force from all the relevant agencies headed by the governor and myself and the health and human services and police and uh, licensing and consumer affairs and the National Guard, et cetera. And we met every single day to keep the issue really at top of mind. And I have to commend our governor because I think he was an excellent communicator regularly with the people, uh, reminding them of what we needed them to do, what we needed them to know um, and where we were in our, in our planning. I think, uh, the uh, governor, uh, the lieutenant governor of Hawaii made a, a, a very relevant point uh, about how the pandemic also highlighted the disparities. Uh, because when you have to do virtual learning, then you are confronted with the children who uh, do not have connectivity, the disparity in uh, technology uh, that is available to our students. And we had to address that by giving uh, students in those instances uh, devices uh, to, be, to be used virtually. Um, we had the opportunity to also uh, provide, uh, in some cases, the ability for students to access the internet. We had to think about supporting our teachers um, by providing them some grants uh, because they too were dealing with their families, uh, the anxieties of the pandemic, all at the same time that we were requiring them to plan for their students as well. Um, and I think it's, it's we're, we're now at the place of experimenting with the uh, combination of doing both virtual and in-person learning. Uh, but of course, you are faced with the realities of uh, requiring testing uh, very regularly and constantly and be prepared to act when positives come in. Um, how do we isolate uh, those positives and not 
uh, have great outbreaks in our community. I think we have been really blessed and really successful when I listen to the devastating impacts, for instance, on tourism. Uh, our economy never really shut down uh, because we, we were battling with that question. On the one hand, how do you keep your people safe? And on the other, how do you keep your economy from being devastated? There was a natural attrition because for the first time, planes were coming empty um, or with just a few persons on board. Uh, but then as, as the reputation for the territory uh, for dealing with the pandemic spread, the visitors have increased. So that while we are experiencing the loss of the cruise ship, uh, industry, our air arrivals are now almost coming back to pre-2017, pre-hurricane levels. We have had uh, all of the major carriers have added flights to the territory, uh, Delta, American Airlines. Uh, in fact, a new carrier came to the territory during the pandemic in Frontier um, Airlines. And we have also seen the resurgence of our marine industry because of the devastating impacts of the closures around the Caribbean. Our very closest neighbor, the British Virgin Islands, that uh, at one time uh, drew from us so much of our charter yachting industry, their borders were closed. And so a lot of those vessels came to the territory. Um, in fact, we have the premier um, charter yacht uh, company, the Moorings, they have established and uh, now in the territory and are prepared to uh, do business here. And all of this has happened despite the fact that we lost some of our major hotels uh, still in the reconstruction from um, the 2017 hurricanes. Our Airbnbs and villas are pretty much bursting at the seams, um, where we even have people who are finding it easier to come to the territory uh, to get a vaccine than they are able to in some of their home states. And so we've had uh, a divergence of experience with, with this whole pandemic. One of the things that you focused on in your career has been um, pretty much focused on reducing inequalities. And I'd say that you did that uh, by your work in uh, trying to address political status issues of the US Virgin Islands, right? And of course, we in Guam have um, same challenges. Um, one of the observations I've had um, during the unfortunate um, uh, natural disaster that hit both Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands was a pause for all of us in the territories with uh, what we thought uh, would, could be a policy from the last administration of withholding aid to territories. Um, fortunately, the Puerto Ricans had a period of time where they were dealing with this where we normally would see the national government be right then, um, right there in support, trying to address uh, natural disasters. Uh, but it's also now been my um, observation that in this change of administration, um, the president has certainly made uh, lots of efforts to make sure that um, territories and tribal um, and tribal governments are going to be brought along. Uh, while we continue to battle the pandemic and uh, see, uh, get us to the light at the end of the tunnel. So dealing with um, inequities or inequalities, it really is almost a regular experience, um, not only for um, our two territories, but including for the state of Hawaii, which has challenges uh, with uh, shipping and commerce, you know, the price of groceries and gas is much higher in, um, in Hawaii than many places. So we deal with uh, some of um, the issues where at least in the territories, we're, whether or not we're treated domestic or foreign um, and in the state of Hawaii where sometimes domestic policy um, undermines uh, the effectiveness of the state of Hawaii. So in looking at inequalities and inequities uh, and uh, Josh, you mentioned um, you know, some of the disparities in access to healthcare. I mean, we're dealing with um, our islands, our governments have to address a lot of um, disparities, socioeconomic disparities amongst our population, uh, where new industry, new commerce, 
uh, has created a definite um, great standard of living for some, but for those that have um, access to education and access to healthcare issues, it's uh, many of them could feel left behind. What efforts um, are you undertaking or what examples uh, could you give us in the state of Hawaii um, in trying to bring uh, those of us less fortunate into the modern age into some level of prosperity? So forgive me for being muted there. Uh, well, so we've had a lot of different entities that have wanted to partner with us. I, to underscore what you described, Josh, it, it, um, we're about 22% short of healthcare providers across the state, but we're 40% short in areas where there is um, a significant step off economically. So if you go to Waianae on, on Oahu or on the Big Island in the rural areas, that's how, that's how serious the the shortages of healthcare providers can be. And so what we've done is we've partnered with the University of, of, of Hawaii's medical school, JABSM, Johnny Burns School of Medicine, uh, to create rural scholarships so that kids, especially if they are local, uh, can get scholarships to go to medical school or nursing school or physician assistant school, and then uh, make a commitment to work in our rural areas. That's very important. Uh, it's actually what brought me to Hawaii, although I wasn't, of course, a, a Hawaii kid. Uh, but you know, I was committed to working in, in the National Health Corps, which was a, a blessing for me. And we need to offer and create those kind of state opportunities to do that. Our, another example, I think you got to hear from, you know, one of our stars earlier, and that was um, about our Aloha Connections Innovation Program. So where it's, a, it's basically a pipeline program for resiliency so that we can develop jobs for local kids, for anyone in Hawaii, uh, using some Federal CARES Act money, we're beginning to, to create that, that kind of a system where we can have large numbers of people get, I don't want to say an internship, but, you know, to do partnerships with companies that are local that will then mentor these young people into serious jobs. And that will create a lot of economic activity because it really is just something you have to kind of um, tap into. We have so many extraordinarily bright young people around but they're, a lot of the times their inclination is to leave because it's expensive and breaking the cycle of poverty is super difficult. So that kind of thing, we call it the Kupu Aina Corps. I don't know if it was mentioned earlier, uh, is very helpful. It focuses on environmental projects, which is also good because it's green and it, you know, it's a green growth project, which we expect to make a big part of our economy going forward. Um, as I serve, I, I'm very committed to that. So you know, they brought in millions and millions of dollars. It's diverse. And then it creates feeders for our companies. But that money goes right back into the community of need. So as Lieutenant Governor Roach was saying, these disparities, like if you don't have broadband, well, if, if all of a sudden one of um, the children in the family has a very good paying job, they can begin to either politically advocate for themselves or actually invest in their family and household. And I think there's been a longstanding tradition of people in developing nations, I'm not saying we are in developing nations, but I, you know, we obviously still have pockets of underdeveloped uh, economies in our states. And so it approximates that problem. But when we have that kind of opportunity, it's pretty sustainable. You immediately get all kinds of support from the private sector because they're very interested. I can't tell you how often I actually have this strange mismatch where we have poverty, we have the need to get people into jobs, and then we have employers that are dying to hire young, motivated people with some skill. They just have to give them that skill. And so that's another thing that we're very focused on. And I think that after, whether it's a pandemic or a natural disaster uh, or a man-made disaster, say as 9-11 was, when people rebuild, they, we often rebuild from the um, kind of our roots. And so putting scholarships in, putting things like AmeriCorps, the Hawaii Health Corps, the National Health Corps, or Kupu Anakor. All these things are opportunities, We're kind of like planting seeds. Not usually a lot of money, but it's a seed to quickly get someone economically accelerated. And it's those economic accelerators, which may very well be what, what our state has to do. I, obviously, I, I would not be so presumptuous as to speak uh, for Guam or the Virgin Islands, but I, I think that if we do have that in common, it, is, it does uh, show promise for us here in Hawaii. 
And Tim Governor Roach, um, you know, two notorious populations for being uh, underserved in, um, in our system, in the American system, are individuals um, that are disabled and those that are suffering some mental health challenges. And in your work, in your private sector work and your public sector work, you focused a lot of your practice and your uh, civic work on uh, trying to advocate for rights for individuals with disabilities and those uh, with uh, mental health um, issues. Um, how, what kind of efforts do you think um, need to be made to advance uh, the livelihoods of individuals with disabilities and those fa facing mental, uh, uh, mental illness in your government or in your island? Well, I, we are challenged uh, in the territory with attracting uh, the type of healthcare professionals that we need to service our population in general. And I think that applies to a variety of areas, uh, psychiatry, um, uh, cardiology, uh, et cetera. And so one of the responses that we are exploring as a community is the establishment of our own medical school at the University of the Virgin Islands, which would uh, that perhaps enable us to train uh, uh, doctors here and to retain them in our communities uh, as we as we move forward. I think we all recognize that part of the uh, experience with mental illness and the homeless also uh, is tied into substance abuse and uh, uh, lack of the appropriate infrastructure to support people who fall in those categories, both uh, housing uh, for the homeless, as well as um, for us to address these issues of, of, of substance abuse. Um, the administration, the Brian Roach administration, we have committed to ensuring uh, access to vocational rehabilitation for, for uh, people suffering with uh, mental illnesses and to try to uh, create as much opportunity in the workforce for people who have uh, physical and other disabilities. Uh, one of the issues of disparity that you, you uh, brought up with and to which the Lieutenant Governor spoke uh, has to do, uh, I believe, uh, with education in our community and access to education. That is a predominant uh, factor in terms of access to opportunity. And we have been so uh, much as territories been reliant on leadership uh, from the United States. And I think this uh, kind of discussion gives us the opportunity to also highlight uh, our thinking and our, our, our accomplishments. What we have become the first uh, historically black uh, university in the United States to offer our students uh, no tuition, uh, tuition free um, admission to our university to complete their bachelor's degree. And I think I, I really don't know of that many schools in the United States in general that does that. We are in our second year of that program. The first school year uh, was the uh, fall 2019 um, the spring 2020 school year, and we had 195 students admitted who did not qualify for any other uh, financial assistance that our uh, program was able to support them in being admitted to the university. In addition to having them ad admitted tuition free, we're also uh, creating uh, internship opportunities for them to uh, be able to uh, put their skills to use while they're in college. And we also have a component of the program that requires them to work in the territory for a period of time uh, after they complete their studies. And we also recognize that the, there is also the need for educational opportunity and vocational opportunity for those students who do not choose 
uh, academia, who do not choose a uh, university. And so one of our projects uh, that we have embarked on is uh, an apprenticeship program and what we call the skills, uh, one second, the, skills, uh, bringing new skills to the workforce. And we have identified partners in the private sector in both marine and healthcare that will provide up to 625 uh, internship, apprenticeship opportunities for students in the workforce. And so the, uh, to bring them into the workforce. And so there, I think there are multiple ways that we are uh, working on this goal, which I think is goal four under the, um, the sustainable goals of, of the United Nations Charter that relate to education. Um, and I think the, that's awesome. Go ahead. No, I was just going to tie it up by saying it, the greatest part of, one of the greatest uh, uh, factors there is the opportunity to bring in uh, the private sector as well as the public sector um, to accomplish uh, these goals and objectives. I was going to say that uh, a lot of the examples and the programs you cited are certainly um, worth uh, adopting. Uh, in some cases, we do some similar work, but um, looking forward to um, looking at those examples and sharing it with our community here. I wanted to thank you for your time. I don't know how much time you have, but I do want to invite you to stay on just a little bit longer if you can. Uh, we have some folks from your jurisdictions that are joining this panel that I think are great change agents. Uh, and so joining the panel uh, from the U.S. Virgin Islands is Deanna James from the St. Croix Foundation, uh, which is a very, very good, um, excellent, excellent um, example of uh, the partnership between the nonprofit world and um, Citizen Action, and John Leung, co-founder and chairman and CEO of Pono Pacific Land Management and co-founder and chief executive officer of KUPU, which itself is an awesome, a very successful program. They're joined by Dr. Margaret Hattori Ochima. She is the Dean of the University of Guam School of Health. And uh, from our neighbors up north from the Northern Mariana Islands, Deanna James, uh, Reina Suarez, the director of the Community Guidance Center of the Commonwealth Health Corporation. Before we bring them onto the panel, uh, we have an excellent, very special message, short message from uh, the Vice President of the Philippines. Uh, being second in command, I, I understand she has a bit more complicated situation than we do, but Vice President Maria Lenore Girona Robredo, Vice President of the Philippines. My warmest greetings to the University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability, your partners in the Global Island Partnership and Local 2030 Islands Network, and everyone joining us for the 12th Conference on Island Sustainability. I hope you are all safe and well. COVID-19 stands as humanity's greatest challenge in the immediate term. Around the world, healthcare systems are close to being overwhelmed. Economies are shrinking, and entire populations edge closer to poverty and hunger. Fishers old and new are surfacing in society, compromising the rights and dignities of the most vulnerable. Here in the Philippines, with cases reaching record highs even after a year of lockdown, COVID-19 continues to disrupt almost all aspects of our lives, changing the way we live, the way we work, the way we learn. In the face of such quick and drastic changes, it becomes even more important that we regain our anchorage. And one way we can do that is by revisiting the shared horizon ahead of us and the goals we have been working towards even before the pandemic. This conference on sustainability, particularly on the work we have all been doing in pursuit of the sustainable development goals, is a good place to start. It is an opportunity to refocus on our objectives, identify the gaps that need to be filled, 
find ways to contribute and work together, and reflect on the lessons and insights we have learned in our work towards achieving the SDGs and its universal call to end poverty, protect the planet, and bring peace and prosperity to everyone. One important lesson is that the SDGs address interrelated challenges because what we do in one aspect of our lives deeply affects all other aspects. For instance, as we have seen here at home, the goals of zero poverty, zero hunger, and good health and well-being depend on clean water and sanitation. All these are difficult to achieve without decent work and economic growth. And without this, we are also hard-pressed to deliver basic services. Poverty is also high in areas with conflict or with weak peace and order because the lives of people are constantly under threat, which is why we have the SDG on peace, justice, and strong institutions. The challenge of achieving the SDGs is great, and the pandemic has only made it more difficult. The task is daunting, but we cannot let paralysis settle. As the global challenges we face are interlinked, so must we need to pull together to harmonize our actions if we are to attain these goals. As we work our way towards a more sustainable world, it becomes clear. The greater the challenge, the greater the imperative to pull together. This philosophy animates the work we do at the Office of the Vice President, especially in our anti-poverty flagship program, Angat Buhay which is our contribution to the fulfillment of the SDGs. It focuses on six key advocacy areas, food security and nutrition, universal health care, public education, rural development, housing and resettlement, and women empowerment. In the Filipino language, angat buhay means uplifting life. And that is precisely what we hope to achieve by bringing together various organizations from the private and the public sector to find the best solutions to the urgent problems faced by the farthest and poorest communities in our country. As of December 2020, we have been able to partner with 330 organizations, mobilizing 441 million pesos worth of resources for 341,779 families and 221,122 Filipinos in 381 communities nationwide. Our work is far from over. In getting back on track in pursuit of the SDGs, our task now is to link up with the rest of the world, not just to weather the crisis of the present, but to reimagine the future. More of us will be needed to do the work so that we can find even more ways to move towards a more sustainable planet. This is the best place to start. The brightest minds of the world are already here with us today. Find ways to reach out, to fill the gaps, to collaborate with wider networks that can work on bigger scales, not just across organizations and institutions, but across our islands and our planet. Lend your resources, your skills, your knowledge, so that everyone's strengths can be consolidated towards a singular vision, towards a truly better normal we hope for, a world that is more humane, more equitable, more sustainable. Much work remains, but with you leading the way, I have faith that we will find the best path to the future of our hopes. Thank you and mabuhay. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President Robredo. We really truly appreciate the time that you um, have given us to uh, participate in our conference. Uh, now it's uh, my pleasure to bring on um, four more panelists in the group. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll start with uh, Reina Suarez. Now Reina um, manages the CNMI's behavioral health programs in partnership with the CDC. And uh, Reina, welcome uh, to Guam virtually. Uh, hope everything is well up there in Saipan. Um, in what ways, uh, and you know, you heard earlier that Lieutenant Governor Green and Lieutenant Governor Roach talked about the disparities that exist in the state of Hawaii and in the US Virgin Islands because of a lack of medical per personnel, professionals, for example. Uh, 
In what ways can islands continue to provide better access to health services and resources as we recover from this pandemic? Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for having me um, and to, to all the moderators and panelists. Um, the CNMI definitely, as, as Lieutenant Governor Roach was sharing earlier um, in terms of lack of, and, and Lieutenant Governor Green, CNMI as well has a lack of providers, um, certainly in the behavioral health care field. Um, and so I think for the CNMI, in wanting to, to recruit, we've worked very closely with our Pacific Behavioral Health um, Collaborating Council and worked regionally to build um, our local workforce um, with substance use disorder uh, certification. We've been able to, to address it regionally and promote that uh, regional workforce um, strengthening in that area. Uh, with our licensed mental health providers, I think that's an area we definitely need work on. Um, I, I appreciate the sharing of information in terms of training and recruiting and retaining that definitely needs to happen and, and creating those opportunities um, that were shared. Um, so I really feel like it has to be um, as it's a shared challenge, a regional, uh, national, global even um, effort that's made uh, across um, the healthcare systems. Um, it, Not, to add, I would say that definitely um, something to improve access is I would say stigma remains for, for the CNMI and I would think others, something that needs to be addressed um, in terms of having our community members more willingly um, access behavioral health care services. You know, in uh, his uh, remarks earlier, Lieutenant Governor Green talked about the methamphetamine problem that uh, has been plaguing the state of Hawaii. And of course, here in Guam, We've had a 30 year experience of uh, a large number of our people addicted to methamphetamine. Um, I know that uh, there's been some movement uh, to focus in on um, drug uh, substance abuse programs up in the Northern Marianas. Um, are there anything, uh, any programs or any aspects of that that perhaps you think could, uh, you could share with our community here? Sure, more recently and um... I know that we had spoken, Lieutenant Governor, the last time I was on Guam about the um, the governor's um, substance uh, abuse and uh, use disorder, the, the facility up in, in our north side of our island and the inpatient um, services that are being offered there. And so definitely working in, in networking with all our resources here in the CNMI to to really complement each other in terms of outpatient services and linkages streamline linkages to um, to those inpatient services um, and we definitely are, are still building and working on um, resources and securing the resources to to streamline those services um, and uh, we're thankful though that we we can at least on both uh, in both programs we do have um, intensive outpatient services that are being conducted and so that widens of course the uh, the opportunities for our folks that are they're needing those types of services, but definitely working toward solidifying the, the partnerships. Um, more recently, we did have um, a methamphetamine and opioid um, consortium meeting with uh, over 60 of our public and private and faith-based representatives uh, just last month to be able to, to, we're in the midst of doing a comprehensive needs assessment, which is uh, definitely crucial in terms of making sure that we have feedback into how we utilize the resources that we have and address the needs of our community around methamphetamines and certainly with opioids as well. Now, the, the Northern Mariana Islands have experienced tremendous success battling the pandemic, uh, managed to be able to keep uh, pretty much your community spread down. Um, I know there's been a very aggressive quarantine program for inbound travelers into the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, and uh, the Northern Marianas, I might add, uh, is a leader uh, in the region in healthcare and healthcare organization and uh, in some of the progressive things that you're able to handle. Um, of course, there's challenges that we share because of the limited number of clinicians. Um, how would you best describe the, the work of uh, the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Health um, corporation with um, COVID. Um, already you have a system with limited um, 
medical professionals uh, and some services, but how is uh, living in the COVID realm affected um, your age, your agency? Has have there been any silver linings or any opportunities that you've been able to recover as a result of this pandemic? I definitely will say with the with our Commonwealth Healthcare Corporation, our, our CEO, Dr. Esther Munya, has been at the forefront since the beginning and early on um, with COVID, establishing really uh, plans with contact tracing and, and with the, the quarantine and, and um, facilities, um, securing resources and things of that sort. Uh, she and I would say with our with our leadership, our even our chief medical officer, they have been at the forefront at, of this and rallied together all the resources in the CNMI to be able to address it. And I think that's what she would focus on. And I would agree is everyone has to come together. It's affecting everyone. And this was a, a time where we saw um, local resources in the private and public sector, as well as you know, federally come in regionally to, to assist where the needs were greatest. And only then were we able to, to direct the resources accordingly to where the needs were greatest. That's a good uh, time to bring in uh, Dr. Margaret Hattori Uchima into the conversation. And uh, Dr. Hattori Uchima is Dean of the University of Guam School of Health. She's a nurse uh, and a nursing leader on Guam. Um, Dr. Hattori Uchima, you really did go above the call of duty in your response to COVID. Uh, we've been working alongside each other in our response to homelessness, um, but uh, and that's given us an opportunity to really take a look at um, the level of care and the access issues for the homeless population. But for the greater population, you played a very key coordinating role, not only in the COVID testing, uh, but into contact tracing and now the vaccination. Could you describe the partnership uh, and the program that you've managed to forge together with Carlos Titan over there at the University of Guam um, in partnership with the government of Guam? Thanks so much. I really appreciate being here and great listening to, to the Lieutenant Governors. Uh, very inspirational uh, to hear uh, some of the similarities, right, that, that we're facing as well. Um, but yes, Lieutenant Governor, we, uh, you know, when the, the governor declared the state of emergency, all of our uh, local government employed nurses were essentially activated and mobilized, right? And so, um, immediately we were called upon, you know, even before the state of emergency and, and notified by public health that as nurse leaders, we would need to um, start thinking about how we could help with the manpower shortage. And the University of Guam has nursing, social work, and health science students, um, as well as other programs, but I only oversee those three, those three programs. And so we knew that the extreme shortage of nurses, which you know CNMI also faces and, and Hawaii also has shortages, we knew that we would need to look to students from UOG and GCC, as well as the faculty, the nurses at GDOE. Um, and early on, there was, uh, you know, th there was some, not, I wouldn't say panic at all, but there were some difficulties, right, in immediately mobilizing personnel from one agency to another. Um, in working with you with the homeless uh, and other, other um, communities that needed assistance, uh, there were some structural barriers, right? And so uh, being at the university, we're fortunate in that, um, you know, we're able to work collaboratively across government and non-governmental agencies with the private sector as well. And so uh, in working with you and the governor, you, essentially you empowered us, uh, Carlos Taitano and I and the president and our senior vice president uh, to do whatever we thought UOG could do to assist. And so immediately we um, placed our faculty and our students uh, with public health, GMH, GRMC, uh, wherever you know we could, even though we're small numbers. But that collaboration with uh, Gov Guam led to uh, a small group of us working directly with uh, the governor's office and trying to bring out uh, UCSF um, to collaborate and provide technical assistance to uh, refine the public health contact tracing, case investigation, and outbreak management um, due to the COVID pandemic. And so 
Uh, I really appreciated the ability to try to collaborate um, beyond being simply an academic program. Uh, and I think that was very, very important. And now more recently, we've been able to work with the National Guard um, at uh, the UOG Fieldhouse using that asset uh, in order to provide a, a you know, great venue for vaccinations. Yesterday, they vaccinated over 2,000. And last week, they were vaccinating over 1,000 a day. Um, and so that's been you know, a, a really wonderful collaboration. Um, and then lastly, of course, your collaboration with the, the Homeless Coalition and um, you know, setting up the Interagency Council on Homelessness uh, and Poverty Prevention. I think that's a stellar example of a, a government, uh, public sec uh, private sector, and um, the nonprofits uh, uh, collaborating together. Uh, and so, sorry, that's a long-winded response, <laughs> but it's no, just no, the no, beauty actually, of this you know, collaboration, I mean, right? <laughs> right. And I think uh, when we did this, uh, the underlying issue is trying to prevent poverty and to be very honest about the socioeconomic situation uh, that many on the island are facing, uh, you know, where there's no running water, uh, sewer is a challenge, power. So there are some issues, um, I think, that um, are that we need to work together on. But, you know, one of the, the dominant things is just preventing hunger uh, and trying uh, to center on um, getting to a place where there's zero hunger. Um, where do you think... Um, we need to go in addressing hunger. You know, there's food banks that have been set up. Uh, I know that we're trying to get community gardens together, uh, but unfortunately, um, people that don't have money usually are consuming things that are the most unhealthy. Um, can you think of any strategies to try and uh, maybe address the education element or the exposure element to try and um, address nutrition for uh, for people that are suffering from poverty. Yes, yeah, that's a great question, and and slightly out of my 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 expertise, right? We've got people like Dr. Tanisha Afflegui, um and, and uh, Dr. Bob Barber, uh, and of course Dr. Rachel Leaguero did a lot of groundbreaking um, research on childhood obesity and obesity prevention. Uh, and in fact, worked with the University of Hawaii on the Children's Healthy Living Program. Um, but, but yes, there's a lot that can be done. Um, and our um, uh, CNAS, our College of Natural and Applied Sciences, through their cooperative extension as well, um, does work and provide some education, uh, for instance, SNAP-Ed, right, to educate families that are recipients of, of uh, that public assistance. Uh, on how to select healthier foods, right? Partnering with, for example, uh, the grocery stores and having those labels that show which foods are healthy. Uh, simple things like that uh, and continuing those types of partnerships with very, um, gosh, I, I, I don't mean to say logical, but very practical solutions. You know, putting up a sticker to show what's a healthy meal, I mean, a healthy snack to buy is a lot simpler than having to teach someone how to read a label. While we've always done that for years, tried to teach people how to read a label, you know, a really cute sticker uh, is more eye-catching and, and that appeals to a broader range of people. Um, so simple things like that. And then of course, um, Dr. Barber and others at the University of Guam have been working on exactly what you said, community gardens. Um, and I think that that work needs to continue. And I see Car Carlotta Leonguero smiling there um, because uh, of course, <laughs> uh, Island Girl Power, uh, you know, it's very wonderful organization. They've got their community gardens um, and that gets young people into gardening. Hawaii ha is, you know, far ahead uh, and, and doing much in the effort to get young people and, uh, involved in gardening and sustainability. So I think that those types of efforts need to be supported. Successful ones like Island Girl Power, uh, I think are the models. And we need, instead of reinventing, right, focus our resources on the the programs that are working. And I got to thank you, Lieutenant Governor, because you and, and, and the governor stood up the Interagency Council um, on, uh, on homelessness and poverty prevention. And that it's not only about homelessness, it's about preventing poverty and preventing that cycle through education, through increasing transportation, providing health care. And, you know, Lieutenant Governor Green said it, he's so wise when he said, 
you know, housing, having a house directly impacts your health. And we, you know, we all know that, but for to him, have him say that, I think is very, very key. Uh, and we had a homeless coalition meeting yesterday and that was brought up as well. So, you know, there, the, that's a gem. Uh, but anyway, yes, th those are some ideas. I have to give him props too, because um, although, uh, and hopefully the Congress will uh, help and remove our Medicaid cap that all the territories have been um, faced with, uh, which has resulted in limiting health care in some cases, but Lieutenant Governor Green was able to get uh, Medicaid uh, to um, basically fund and approve a, a program strategy uh, that, connects, uh, that connects housing to those, uh, I guess I would call them uh, re repeat visitors into the ER, um, that uh, those visits go down when they have a place to recover and a very stable place uh, to live. Uh, it's a good transition to bring in uh, somebody from the state of Hawaii um, that I'd like that I'm very excited to to bring to the group, um, John Leung. John um, is one of the co-founders of Kupu, and John, the organization you co-founded back in 2007, has uh, laid the foundation for a green transformation, if you will, of Hawaii's economy and providing the youth with environmental conservation skills. And the creation of the Kupu Conservation Corps in providing employment in environmental and climate projects, including farming and agriculture for unemployed hospitality workers has been cited to be a fitting example of for Biden's Civilian Climate Corps initiative. So John, uh, can you share with us how other islands can use this model that you've created with their Kupu Conservation Corps as a model to promote a green, educated, highly skilled workforce, but really a problem-solving workforce. Absolutely. And first of all, I just want to say thank you for having me here today, Lieutenant Governor, and thank you to, to the, all the other speakers for sharing your wisdom and, and the great work you're doing, and to our uh, other Lieutenant Governors as well. I uh, really appreciate it. And to, to Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, Thank you for the shout out earlier. And as well, thank you for all the great work you're doing to protect our community and, and move our community forward. Um, you know, I, I would say that there's so much wisdom that has already been shared that, and that, you know, there's so much to borrow upon. Um, uh, Dr. Margaret Hattori, Hattori shared about collaboration. And I think that is really, you know, fundamental, realizing that this is a time for us to come together uh, there's so much division in our world, but if we want to create lasting impact, this is a time for us to come together. And uh, Lieutenant Governor Roach shared about, you know, that there's COVID has provided us with opportunities like family time. But I, I believe another really great opportunity as well is that it's it's given us a chance to push the metaphoric pause button in our world that, you know, we're just going, 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 going to events, building our economy, doing things business as usual. But now that things have had to be shut down a little bit, I think the opportunities that we are all looking at and thinking, how can we make tomorrow or this next season better than it has been? And, and really sometimes some of the things that we've adopted and inherited may not be the ways that we want it to be for our kids and for the future generations. And I think that as we look at it as islands in particular to your question, Lieutenant Governor, uh, we know that there's an inherent connection to our land uh, to caring for our community and to caring for one another. And really that's the work that Kupu has been about for, since we started in 2007. And uh, that led us to the point being, being having done programs like this that when uh, coronavirus hit, we were um, able to help respond. And as uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Green already generously shared about us, we, had the, we started a Kupu Anacor program in collaboration with the state that utilized CARES funds. And basic, the basic model that we utilized was we, we have a youth core model where we get young people or young, young adults working in different conservation, sustainability, and agricultural projects um, throughout the state. And uh, they, they get paid. Uh, we have educational opportunities where we partner with our local universities, like the University of Hawaii and the community colleges, to give certificates and credits out. And, uh, and then uh, we also are helping out uh, a lot of different uh, partic uh, participating partners 
that were impacted economically. These include like nonprofits who lost a lot of their funding uh, after COVID and uh, farms that lost uh, hospitality and restaurant sales uh, because, of, uh, because of the lack of business. And so being able to support them was, was really great. Um, in, in all, we were able to, to, in just a few short weeks, stand up a, a program that was predicated on our other model where we had about, we were asked to do 300 positions. We were able to fit 360 positions in our budget. We had over 1,300 applicants for those positions. Um, and we, we supported over 150 different partners within the community, so nonprofits, businesses, ag agricultural organizations. Um, in total, they did really great work for the environment, which was about 20,000 acres were impacted positively by the programming. Um, there was over uh, $6.5 million in socioeconomic impact. Uh, and the program costed $3 million. So it was a, over a one to two cost to benefit ratio that occurred uh, because of the programs that, um, and uh, well, what to me is really exciting is that, you know, as, as was mentioned earlier, we had a lot of people in the hospitality sector that had lost their jobs. Um, but what was exciting to me is that they, many of them found a new passion. And, you know, as we, part of the goal in this was to diversify our economy, not to replace tourism. We, we, we know that's gonna be an economic driver, but to diversify and we can have more legs that are being built within our island economy, as well as how do we help to pivot existing um, key legs like tourism, where we can create more education and more opportunity to make these areas more sustainable too. And we saw that happen. And so it was really neat. We had, you know, just anecdotally, I was, I saw one of our young members or participants who I hadn't known at the time, but she was wearing a kupu face mask. And uh, we just said, we just started chatting, and she mentioned that she was in our program. She's working for Reuse, which is a uh, they repurpose uh, con old construction materials, and um, and uh, she just found out she loved it. She was working at a bar before the program and uh, before the before COVID, and and basically since February March she was out of a job, um, and in September she got uh, picked up on the program, and and now she has a full time job at Reuse, um, she was picked up to work there after the program. So she found her passion, she found something she really loved to do. And, uh, and we saw in the long-term impact, 60% of our, our, of our participants either got a job, went on to higher education or applied to another KUPU program. And just in the job area alone, 30% of our participants uh, got hired on at the sites that they were working. And this is parallel to 20% unemployment rate throughout the island. So we're, we're we're really um, grateful to be able to have helped out and really excited. And, and it really happened because of collaboration, because of partnerships um, with the state, with, with our partner organizations. And, um, and really, I, I think the, the lesson is, is that, you know, when we face these challenging times, we can, we can run and hide, or we know that there's people that are counting on us and we can stand up and do our part to make a difference. And we just have to have that courage to have the entrepreneurial spirit, to have a vision. And, and the desire to partner together to link arms in a socially distant, safe kind of way, but uh, link arms together to make a difference for, for our community. John, you know, it's an excellent, uh, you know, I can't underestimate um, or understate um, the importance of nonprofit and civic society and really being able to uh, in many ways, respond faster than the government. I, I really am one of those that encourage government to uh, push out as many resources to nonprofits to get things going. Um, and uh, I think strong nonprofit community is a strong, means a strong uh, economy, means a strong government, really stronger services. And I'd like to add and bring into um, this conversation uh, somebody that's coming from the other part of the world, but uh, an Islander nonetheless, um, Deanna James. And Deanna James, um, her organization uh, that she's with, the St. Croix Foundation, and reading about this organization, um, I have to say it's very impressive. Um, the St. Croix Foundation has worked with a, an, uh, and empowered a consortium of nonprofits within the United States Virgin Islands to build community resilience and restore the territory after a very, very destructive um, hurricane in Hurricane Irma back in 2017. 
Uh, and uh, knock on wood, we haven't uh, been experiencing that kind of big disaster, but I definitely can understand how complicated it is to try and rebuild. But there's also many opportunities that present themselves when you're in such state. So um, Deanna, could you share with us about how your work supports and directs investments to these nonprofit partners that you've been empowering? Hello, and thank you so much for the invitation uh, to speak on uh, what is my favorite subject to talk about, which is community um, resilience and civil society. Um, I think it's important to start with just uh, providing some context for how the St. Croix Foundation was, uh, was formed, and we were actually launched in crisis. So we were uh, founded 30 years ago on the heels of Hurricane Hugo, which leveled the island of St. Croix. And Hurricane Hugo was supposed to be our 100 year storm. And um, unfortunately, less than 30 years later, we had two back to back uh, category five hurricanes. First, Hurricane uh, Irma, which uh, severely impacted the islands of uh, St. Thomas and St. John. Um, and then a week later, uh, Hurricane Maria, which uh, devastated the island of St. Croix and then went on to devastate the island of Puerto Rico. And um, what was really interesting is I've been with the foundation for 18 years, but um, it wasn't until Hurricane Maria that so much of how we were founded um, really came to life and that our, our board, our founding board had made some really courageous decisions around what to prioritize. So community foundations historically have prioritized uh, donor fund development and endowment building. And our organization um, leaders decided that because of the circumstances surrounding our inception, where government was basically um, compromised, severely compromised, they had to prioritize civil society. So our nonprofits became sort of the foundation of our foundation. Um, they also prioritize holistic community development, which um, it sounds like, you know, a cliche, but at the end of the day, what they recognized was that everything was connected to everything was connected to everything. So a lot of community foundations often focus on one specific priority, whether it's health, um, whether it's the environment. And for our, our founding board, they understood that in order for uh, us to have a healthy community, we had to recognize the role that every single aspect of our community played um, in creating you know, healthier outcomes. And so um, for us, our one of the key roles that we serve in is as a fiscal sponsor, something that very few community foundations do. And part of the reason they don't do it is because um, technically all of those organizations, and we've served over 250 small burgeoning nonprofits under our 501c3 umbrella. And one of the things that's really unique about that is that um, most foundations don't fully appreciate the role that um, their aim to build endowments plays on the health and capacity of nonprofits. And so our board was once again, really courageous in saying that they wanted to diminish competition for scarce resources in our community. And so those nonprofits actually raise money in our name. Um, and so um, it's one of the things that I think has helped us to build some of the really, really enduring relationships that were necessary when Hurricane uh, Maria came through on the island of St. Croix in particular. And because we didn't have an endowment, our, our organization was focused on, on organizational operational resilience. And so we did things like buried all of our utilities. And what happened after the hurricane is within three to four days, we were up and running and all of our nonprofits um, got wind of this. And um, our office became sort of the hub for nonprofit sort of activism. And, um, and one was another thing that we had done prior, exactly a year prior to the hurricane is we had decided to, to deepen our commitment to nonprofits by creating what has become one of the, the most enduring uh, nonprofit consortium. So we brought together about 50 nonprofit leaders and started talking about uh, organizational uh, sustainability. We talked about aligned mission, um, shared work, and then really building trust. And we spent a year building trust and then the hurricanes happened and those relationships led to some of the single most um, 
progressive, innovative projects that the foundation has in our 30 years ever uh, invested in. Um, we, we had all of these people sitting at one table. We had over 20 to 30 people sitting in our office for over two months. And the profound impact of organizations that we had sectored out. So we had arts and culture organizations, environmental organizations, health and human welfare, youth and education organizations sitting together making decisions about what we were going to prioritize as an organization. And so we, we prioritized things that the foundation had never formally established as priorities, like agriculture. Um, we prioritize solar energy in ways that we, you know, we, we recognize that this investment that our, our board had made decades before was such a powerful example of community resilience. And how do we deepen that investment in other places in our community? And so some of the things that we did, which were, which were the, the brainchild of all of these incredible thought leaders and civil servants sitting in one space saying like, okay, this is how it needs to be done to make sure that all the boxes are checked, that all the intersections of healthy community are addressed in our programming. We did, we created a, a farm tienda initiative where we provided farmers with uh, container farm stands that were not just container farm stands, but were solarized, were Wi-Fi and now serve as community resilience hubs in the, in the advent of COVID. Um, we, we decided that we wanted to prioritize solar and renewable energy. And so we said, well, let's train some young people. Let's focus on workforce development, our youth and education folks were like, we've got to focus on, on education. So let's, let's train some of our young people to become solar installers. And so we spent six months working with the department, the local department of labor to train these young people. Um, when they were done, we then went on to solarize several community centers, one uh, independent living home for the aged, um, another boys and girls club. And, um, and when all was said and done in the advent of COVID, three years later, um, all of those young people were employed at a time when people were losing their jobs. Every single one of them are now fully employed in, um, with solar companies in the Virgin Islands. All of those, those organizations, those community organizations were able to, especially our, our elderly uh, community center was able to support their, their residents in a safe environment and to reduce costs of energy. And so all of these holistic ways of thinking through, um, thinking through what the role of community organizations like ours that support nonprofits has just been transformed because of the involvement of so many voices and so many um, thought leaders in our community sitting at one table and collaborating around some really important um, programming in the, you know, in the event of, you know, these crises, crisis after crisis. And, you know, uh, Lieutenant Governor Roach was talking about, um, you know, the challenges our young people are facing because of COVID. But the reality is our children lost almost a year of education because of the hurricanes. So COVID was, you know, was a compounding mm. crisis that like, I think a lot of people didn't understand that we were dealing with. Um, and our nonprofits for the last almost four years, three and a half years have had to support a community that is in still in very early stages of recovery from the hurricanes. Um, but what I can tell you is that in the last year, um, watching these organizations sort of just activated in ways that I think are often undervalued um, has been inspirational for us. What we have learned about nonprofits is that they are oftentimes the single most stabilizing force in community. They have some of the most seasoned leaders. They are natural collaborators. They're foot soldiers and innovators and visionaries. And they live on the front lines of challenges every day. And as a result of that, they are nimble and resilient enough to uncover some of, I think, the most prescient solutions to those problems. And yet, oftentimes go unrecognized and undervalued and of course always under-resourced. And so for us as an organization, one of the things that we've been prioritizing um, in the last four years since we launched our consortium of nonprofits is building national partnerships and connecting national funders with specific sectors. And so what, we're, what we do now is we ask our, our, our organizations that sit in our consortium 
to work hard at not doing fundraising alone, to do fundraising at sectors. And it's been really profound to see organizations come together to work through sort of, you know, shared work, like what, what pieces of the work each of them are willing to take on, and then to actually take a case for support to national funders for the entire sector and for a body of work instead of for one singular organization. Um, I can tell you it has been, it's transformed our organization. It has deepened our work and deepened the impact. One of the final projects that came out of this was that one of the, the things our, our board did is they uh, acquired property over the years. And one of them was an abandoned uh, movie theater that we had vision at some point we were going to turn into a state-of-the-art performing arts center. And one of the stakeholders that worked out of our office over the two months after the hurricane was a FEMA. There were some federal responders that were working out of our office. And they just, you know, were like, what is that building back there? And we said, it's an old, you know, abandoned theater. And they sat down with us and said, hey, can we think, rethink, you know, your vision for this facility? And we all got all of our, our partners together and were able to come up with the concept of, yes, transforming it into a, a state of the art performing arts center, but also it will serve as. Um, one of the newest and largest uh, community disaster shelters. And so like all these ways that we were able to just, you know, use, identify resources and to rethink and reimagine how we, uh, we develop like really sustainable solutions for a community that is isolated, that is under-resourced has been um, really profound. I think an example for other uh, organizations like ours to, to follow. Deanna, thanks so much for giving us some good insight on really what I would say is amazing work. It's a great model. Um, and, you know, we only have a few more minutes uh, left. I wanted just to bring on, bring back uh, Lieutenant Governor Green and Lieutenant Governor Roach. And with these couple minutes, uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, Josh, where do you see the state of Hawaii a year from today? Well, we will actually be fully recovered, as shocking as that is. Um, the, you know, what that means is we're actually taking up the many problems that Deanna and, and Margaret and Raina and everyone's been mentioning, John, I mean, back to some of our focus on food sustainability and housing for those who can't access it and finding ways to rebuild our nonprofit sector that obviously got, you know, crushed during the downturn of economic activity in Hawaii. One thing has become clear, and that's because our COVID numbers have been relatively low or very low compared to many other places, and because people have been isolated and tragically isolated, there's a great desire to reconnect. The concept of Hawaii always is a paradise of, of you know, the highest order for many. And one thing we also noticed was that two or three cycles of travel, maybe more, that people normally take just vanished, um, though they want to still experience what you know what Hawaii is about so we're anticipating a whole lot of people come here and we're trying to reconcile that with the reality that going into the pandemic we were actually hoping to scale back tourism some and focus on other things we we had reached over 10 million visitors a year and we really only can sustain eight so uh, we expect a lot of people to come to the aisles uh, it's beautiful here right I mean I don't need to say that to you because Guam is beautiful and Virgin Islands are beautiful I mean all these places but um, for those who are not maybe on our call, who might have gone to Europe, they're not going to Europe this year, I can tell you that. They're probably going to come visit all of us. And we think that we'll try to, you know, really put on a wonderful face again for people. And as we recover, I'm really pushing a different approach, making sure that our under, um, I should say, our, yeah, those who have not received enough care and consideration over the years, really benefit as we rebuild. And so that's where we're I only have a minute here. left. Um, I have one more minute left, but Trugenza, where is the US Virgin Islands going to be in a year? Well, I think our economy will continue to be robust. Uh, we are expecting some of the major hotels to come back online, uh, such as the Marriott and the St. Thomas St. John District. Um, we are looking at more resilient infrastructure. Uh, just next week, I'm going to be going to the groundbreaking for our undergrounding uh, 
project on the island of St. Croix. Uh, part of that is to underground all the utilities in our towns, Fredericksburg, Christiansburg, Charlotte Amalia, Cruz Bay, and our uh, highly populated uh, housing communities as well. Uh, so that 50% of our uh, meter-based customers would be uh, having their services delivered on the ground. Uh, I want to uh, see us to continue to evaluate uh, the tourism product that we have. Um, we have succeeded through the pandemic of attracting the overnight visitor, which uh, leaves a, spe a larger spending footprint on the island. Uh, one of the issues that I wanted to raise uh, along with the goals of the, the sustainable goals was we import a large portion of our food, uh, something like 90 to 95% of the food is imported. And every time we have an event like this or an event like a hurricane that affects the delivery of uh, products uh, to the territory, the issues of food security and agriculture come up. And we just recently embarked on a joint venture uh, where we received a, a grant from the U.S. Economic Development Agency, $2 million, a matching government grant of $300,000. And that would create an aquaponic uh, facility on the island of St. Croix, which would include a greenhouse, I think it's 50,000 square feet, and a training center so that Virgin Islanders can, be, uh, can learn the science of uh, aquaponics and to expand our agriculture industry uh, with an important element uh, such as that. So I think there are many uh, exciting things on the horizon. Uh, the St. Croix Community Foundation, as Deanna uh, presented, has had a longstanding commitment uh, to education in the territory as well. And I look forward to seeing us make up some of that time for our students and to provide, whether through additional types of learning academies uh, some supportive work uh, as they continue to rebound from the issues related well, to the pandemic. Thanks for that. And, I, you know, we are all truly rising together. We're about out of time, so I'll pass it on to Phil. Thanks so much for all your time. And Josh and Tregenza, looking forward to seeing you in person sometime soon. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Siduos Moss, Lieutenant Governor Tenorio, and his guest speakers for that enriching and eye-opening panel. You've highlighted the importance of taking care of the human dimension as we plan for more sustainable islands. Before we close, I want to recognize Lieutenant Governor Tenorio for his tremendous dedication to our island's sustainability. He recently received the National Lieutenant Governor's Association of Energy and Environmental Stewardship Award. He also leads the Island-Wide Beautification Task Force, co-chairs the Guam Green Growth Steering Committee, convenes the Interagency Council on Homelessness and the Office of Homelessness and Poverty Prevention, and oversees the appointments and actions of the Climate Change Resiliency Commission, Coral Reef Resiliency Task Force, and Coral Reef Parametric Insurance Task Force. This concludes our second day of the 12th annual UOG Conference on Island Sustainability. Please join us tomorrow for the Island Symposium on the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. NSF includes Seas Island Alliance and our signature event, CIS Sea Talks, Ideas Worth Cultivating and our thematic panel, Islands Are Rising for the Natural Environment. Undunkalina Sudus Maasi for joining us today. Viva Island Sustainability and Viva UOG. Esther Gupat. <laughs>